You need to know that you can accept them the way they are and you still want to encourage them and love them just as they are. Coping with cancer, I guess, is the same for everybody. It's very, very hard, it's stressful. Um, you never know what to expect. And um, so you just have to get on with it, you know? Well, it's one of those things that you do because that's your spouse and that's what you're called to do. So you do what you can at that particular time. I don't think you can be prepared um, for something coming into your life that's unexpected. You just cope and do your best that you can at that particular time. I guess you're always thinking, you know, what would you do if the tables were reversed? What would you like your partner to do for you? So that helped me a lot, um, thinking about it. And instead of saying, because I was always the social convener, so instead of telling Michael, this is what we're doing, or we've been asked to do this, I said, would you like to do this, or would you like to do this? And I find that he is more um, selective in what he does. He doesn't want to waste time doing incidentals, like he really wants to do more valuable things. No, I wasn't prepared for, for, the, for, the, for the whole upheaval, but um, you take one day at a time. That's all you can do with anything. In the sense that his health was changing, was the fact that he probably ate better, exercised more, um, drank less coffee. He, he paid more attention to the diets that, that, that were suggested. Michael's eating habits really changed and he wanted to change them. Um, I had a little bit of influence in what he did, but I would say it came more from him. He was more aware, he was reading packages. Uh, he wasn't really a great shopper before him, but any time he went out, he would always read the labels and see if this was a good pro product or a bad product. Because through he, him attending prostate cancer meetings, um, they've had exposure to intake, food intake, and what's good and what's bad and what you can do for yourself to improve your health. And I think he's really gone on a, <laughs> a, a real binge with this, you know, and he's getting books and looking at cookbooks, etc. That's not good, I don't want it, you know. So I think that um, he's, re he's really educated himself and he's educating me as well and, and our adult children. The quality of life, yes, it did change because we were able to spend more time together, we did more biking, we did more things together, and we communicated better. Things aren't as bad as they always, they can be better and they will be better. And that's what you have to look, look to, to, to the future and hope that it will, you know, that things will be better. We, we had our low periods of time, I can't say it was all you know, wonderful ha-ha, but um, we were confident that we had got, we had the best doctors and we had, um, there were that things were pretty good, so we were that, that that made us feel better. I think when you come close to what you could consider a death on one person's part, that it really makes you think more about the person that you don't take so much for granted. It makes you sit up and say, you know, it could have been worse. Um, he was very lucky to survive it, um, as I'm very lucky to have him, you know. So I think from that aspect, we were very, very fortunate. I'm just very grateful he's around and it wasn't worse than it was. The outlook on our life will bring. I appreciate the care, the care that I gave him before and after surgery. And I think, you know, you take things for granted, but when something like this sort of hits you, like you're walking into a wall and you stop and say, hey, it's not gonna last forever. And I better, appreciates things that are here now, the here and now, rather than waiting for the future. I think that does change your outlook on your life when you've had a, a scare like this. Have an optimistic outlook. I think your outlook is what will, will really guide you through. Uh, gratefulness and um, not that we're religious people because we, we aren't, but I think that um, gra gratitude for what you do have and appreciation is what will carry you through. I think my spouse relied on me because um, there are different things that he wouldn't have been able to do without my help and encouragement because a number of men would, you know, crawl in the shell and say, well, you know, life is over. Well, life isn't always over just because you had prostate cancer. There's other aspects of it. We'd like the caregivers to be able to know that with their support, 
that their partner can become the man that he was before and that they accept him no matter how the outcome of it. And it's something that affects both of them, so they need to really communicate. Caregivers, it's a tough, tough life really. You have to be there for your husband all the time and the family. Okay, the caregiver, as far as the things in their life, um, they need to be a little po you know, more positive and in their daily life just to go on and do the things that they would normally do and not let the uh, anxiousness or the grieving part of things overwhelm them. They need to be on top of it and uh, know that it, you know, one day at a time they'll take all care of things. I'm a very active person. I belong to different groups. I do quilting and I belong to retired teachers. We have luncheons once a month and uh, a group of us played bridge. So I had outlets. We do a lot together. We're, uh, we're um, a couple that we're always on the go. Um, we're always doing things together. We have a big circle of friends from different walks of our parts of our life and we see a lot of our friends, entertain them, and uh, uh, I don't think there was any change that way at all. But I've got some very good friends, and I guess I bent their ear quite a few times, so they were there for me. And one of my close girlfriends had had a brush with cancer, so she was very supportive. Um, I asked her a lot of questions, you know, and she always bent her ear and asked her various things, you know. So. I think that's good to have that sort of a person that you, who basically, she obviously didn't have prostate cancer, but she had ovarian cancer, and she was very supportive, and, and um, she helped me a lot. For me personally, girlfriends um, were very important to me because you could talk to them about what's going on and just know that somebody else was hearing it. Not that they were going to be able to help you, but they were there to listen. And I, I think that's important. I guess that's a thing that really I haven't because I haven't had any me time. All the exercise or groups that I wanted to join were always on the same night as the prostate group. And I would always go to that with him. Now he would turn around and say, no, you go to whatever you want to. But we cut back on the cars, just have one car now. So it's a little bit difficult for me to go one way and him the other. So, so um, no, I've sort of basically been there for him. For myself, as, as I was coping individually, separately from him, I would say read the Bible more. I'd meditate more. I'd do a lot of walking. Um, but I've always ate healthy. And because uh, it's important if you're not healthy, you aren't going to be able to cope with what could happen. And the unknown is always a bit scary. <laughs> and don't let yourself get down. I mean, have your hair done, go out and have your nails done just to feel good about yourself. Because much as your husband's going through it, you're also going through it too. And you have to give yourself a little lift sometimes. Talk about nails, but anyways, I haven't had them done in weeks. But it's important. I think it's important to, to uh, look after yourself to an extent. I mean, give yourself a treat once in a while so that you'll come back feeling better and you can help him pull him up a bit. I took care of myself by keeping up my connection with my friends and I think that's a good outlet for um, a woman to keep your, it's very important to have those female friends um, that you can even just chat to on the, on the phone and not necessarily about your husband's illness or what he's going through but just someone to talk to and laugh with. Our friends and family, are very, we, they really rallied around us and it's very important to know that people care. And uh, we find too that if we found someone, if we, if we hear that someone is really sick, we really make an extra effort to get to call them, to see them, to whatever, because we know how important it is to have people around you. I think love and support, and it sounds corny, but it's true. We've made lasting connections with the people at uh, Man to Man Prostate Cancer Canada. Um, there are three or four couples that we feel very close to. Not that we see them socially, but we see them at the meetings and um, we went to the conference uh, a year ago that was here in Toronto and um, Ron's going to be doing the um, Father's Day run for prostate cancer on 
Father's Day, so uh, I think we've made some friends that we would have never met before, and they're lovely people. I think the basic, the best support system is the prostate cancer group because they have all the updated information and different people have had such a wide variety of um, experiences and they all get to share from one to another so that um, it's a good place to start with. By going to the prostate group, because they have different speakers, we found out a lot more about diets and homeopathic ways and different uh, doctors would come in and give different talks on different um, some of it was too technical, couldn't understand it, but the diet part and the exercise part, those, those people that were specific in those areas were really very helpful. We did get closer because we had to communicate a bit more. And because of his, um, he's a man and he needs a little more encouragement that he still is a man, and uh, it took a little more work and time and spending time together and knowing that it was okay with whatever the results in the end were going to be, we would get through it type of thing. We were able to spend more time together. We did more biking. We did more things together. And we communicated better. As far as the emotional side, um, Ron and I have always been very, very close. Um, doing this interview today, we've just had our 48th anniversary end of March. So we've been together a long time in our same home for a long 46 years. So we share everything and we talk a lot. We had to talk more about it because it affects both of us in one, how is emotions and that are feeling about it and the fact that you have to build the confidence back up and try what you have to do and you're comfortable doing to bring back the what parts of life you can get. We've always been a very close couple. We do things a lot together, probably too much so, but we're, we're a team. And um, I think what it made us appreciate each other a little more because, hey, this could have been very bad. Well, we couldn't have, in the sexual relationships, we couldn't have sexual relation anymore in that, in that sense. But as I said previously, you can still have sexual relationship without having penetration. Jerry's back about 60%, which is very lucky, and he's also 76 right now. And men lose their potency for other reasons besides prostate cancer. Um, he's very optimistic. He, nothing has, I, I really have to compliment him on this. He has been great. Of course, because of the surgery, there's lack of it for a while but there are different methods now available that people can find something that's comfortable with them. And um, he shows the ways of uh, Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra at different times, and uh, they were able to help get the process going. And then, of course, after a while, it, you do it enough, it's done, and he doesn't need those anymore. There are other ways of making each other happy without intercourse. And unfortunately, the only part, the bad part, is that the penis does shrink a couple of inches. His libido was gone, so there was no sex life after that anyway. But we had our hugs and kisses and we laughs and we tried to make sure we laugh every day, but we've forgotten over the last few years. <laughs> we've got to get up to laughing again every day. <laughs> His libido was still the same. It is still the same. So what happens, a lot of men lose their libido because of what's happened to them, and the wives feel unwanted and not desired, where I've never had that because his libido was always the same. He was, he's always been very affectionate and loving. And I, the hardy days go by, he doesn't tell me he loves me every night, so I, I have that much. Some prostate cancers, of course, are much more extensive, so there are lasting effects of the incontinence or the uh, uh, lack of sexual arousal is gone, so they have to either find